All right, good evening, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Cool. Welcome, everyone. My name is Rebecca Hansen. I'm executive director of the Newfound Lake Region Association, and it's great to see everyone in person. We haven't done the State of the Lake in person since 2020. So welcome back, everyone. Um, we are we have some people who are participating remotely. And for those folks, please keep yourself on mute and with your screens off so there's less distraction on our end. And we do have someone monitoring the chat. So um, if you have any questions, go ahead and ask them. We might filter some of them and save them to the end. Um, we wanna avoid going off on tangents. Paul and I both could we'd probably do three or four presentations on um, some of the subjects we're talking about here. So we're trying to make sure we keep this to an hour. So, um, all right, so I wanna just give a quick overview of NLRA. I know most of you know us very well, but we are a watershed organization that's dedicated to conserving and protecting the Newfound Lake and its watershed. We do this in a number of different ways, water quality monitoring, invasive plant management, um, land conservation, land use planning, just to name a few. Education and outreach is also a big component of what we do, making sure we're talking about and celebrating and celebrating the work we're doing and educating folks about it so we can bring more people on board to help us continue to protect this, this treasured resource. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen that we are on a pretty exciting growth trajectory right now. You've probably seen more programs. Um, the programs that existed, we're digging deeper into them, our invasive plant management, we did more weed watching last year than ever before. We're trying to expand our water quality monitoring program. And of course, more education programs, not just like the state of the lake, but programs in schools with um, community centers and other groups as well. So stay tuned, there's more exciting stuff coming. This is really, really thrilling time to be at the head of NLRA. We've got some a great team, a great core of community members and volunteers. Many of you are here as, as, this evening. So. Um, at this point, I want to introduce Paul Pellissier. Paul is, um, tomorrow he'll been with NLRA for 53 weeks. Sorry, we didn't celebrate you on the 52 week mark. Um, but this is kind of, yeah, this is his uh, debut State of the Lake with, with NLRA. And Paul's brought a lot of energy and um, new life into some of our conservation programs. You'll really see that in his presentation this evening. So, um, so in the interest of time, I'm just gonna pass things over to Paul. He's probably gonna to have to adjust things. I guess maybe we don't have the camera set up. So we're all set with that. Oh, good. <laughs> Audrey, does it seem like everyone can hear us okay? No one's no one's complaining. No, it's not. Um, maybe I'll let Paul. Oh, yeah. yeah, no, 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 I'm, 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 well, I'm gonna let you start talking while I try and figure oh, this perfect. out. Oh, so. perfect, okay. Well, I don't um, need the slides for the first little bit here. Yep. Um, so as Rebecca mentioned, um, I'm the conservation program manager here at the NRA, new within the year, uh, which means a couple of things. Number one, I've been doing a lot of learning, so I hope to share some of what I've learned over the past year with you tonight. Um, number two, what I normally tell people my job is, is I'm responsible for kind of the boots on the ground conservation work that we do for the most part. So Rebecca mentioned that we have programs around water quality monitoring, invasive species protection, um, and volunteer engagement. Those all kind of fall on my desk. Um, but I think my favorite part of my job is really I get spent, I get paid to spend a lot of time trying to better understand our local environment. I live in Bridgewater, so this is my local environment. Um, and then I get opportunities like these to try to share what I've learned with you all in order to better protect some pretty unique and special resources. Um, I don't need to tell you how unique Newfound Lake is, um, but I will with some data in a little bit. Um, so in terms of a schedule, tonight's presentation, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the watershed concept, which I'm sure is familiar to most of you. Uh, broadened out a little bit from you know, the textbook definition um, before going into some of the threats that are facing our lake and our watershed. Then I'll talk about where we stand, where our water quality currently is. We've been doing a lot of analysis lately, um, looking about how that has changed over time, which might be new to some of you. Um, and then we'll talk about, of course, how NLRA programs are really uh, building ecosystem resilience for a changing future. So, um, slides should be changing. 
Yep. Let's see. Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, so to start with, um, we'll talk about the watershed and no doubt uh, the concept of a geographic area that drains to a central point, um, in our case, Newfound Lake, um, might be familiar. Um, but we're actually not in the Newfound Lake watershed here tonight. Right? In downtown Bristol, we're in the Newfound River watershed, so which starts at the terminus of the lake, flows into the Pemi River watershed, into the Merrimack, and eventually into the coastal Atlantic watershed. So my point in saying that is no matter where you're at at any given time, you're part of a watershed and your presence there um, exerts some sort of influence on the watershed. Uh, in other English speaking parts of the world, we don't call it a watershed at all. It's called a catchment, right? And I think in my mind, at least, a catchment really calls to mind this idea of a container and thinking about what's contained in a watershed, well, certainly there's the water, our streams, our lakes, uh, our groundwater is contained within that watershed, but we can broaden it out and say, what else is contained in that watershed? And Newfound is really fortunate that we have um, large blocks of intact ecosystems, um, more so than other developed watersheds. And those ecosystems provide a lot of services that we take for granted every day. Right, so certainly the clean water we drink, the air we breathe, the soil we farm, um, the expansive views we all enjoy, those recreational opportunities um, are all ecosystem services that are provided at no cost by, by the watershed. Um, broadening out even more, of course, we're part of our watershed. Our homes, our infrastructure, our roads, um, our daily lives, our friends, our communities are all part of this watershed. And I'd argue that no matter who you are, where you are, that water is this common thread that connects us. Um, you know, that could be physically from up, uphill, upstream users to downstream users, but what happens out in the watershed eventually makes its way down to the lake. All right, I'm going to step off that soapbox for a little bit <laughs> because I also think it's really important um, that however you relate to Newfound Lake and its watershed that, you know, we have a common set of um, facts and, and um, you know, we develop these relationships based on science. So here's kind of the nuts and bolts summary of the Newfound watershed. And there's really three things I want you guys to take away from this slide. Number one, that the watershed is relatively large compared to the size of the lake. Um, number two, it's mostly forested. 88% um, is a little less than the state average in terms of forest cover. Um, but in that 88%, there's quite a bit of dispersed rural development happening. We have an extensive gravel road network to service those developments. Um, we've got active forestry, which certainly has its own environmental impact. Um, and we also have large scale land conservation, which protects the environment. Um, outside of that 88%, of course, we've got concentrated development around town centers, shorelines. Uh, we're seeing a recent uh, little bit of a building boom in those areas. Um, as development concentrates, we get more impervious surfaces, think our roofs, our driveways, our roads, um, and stream and lake degradation are directly tied to impervious surface, surface cover. We'll get into that here in a little bit. Um, the third thing I want you to take away, so we've got a large watershed, it's mostly forested, and it's really steep. So over half of our watershed is over 15% grade. Um, and we have relatively shallow soils, which means water that falls as rain or melts as snow quickly gets to a stream, which is pretty steep, and it flows to our lake um, in short order. So in the business, we call these flashy systems. You can think of flash floods. Um, so when we get large rain events, we see a sudden pulse of most of the water from those rain events coming through our streams. Um, so this uh, volume coming downhill creates a lot of force and that erodes our stream beds. You'll notice that most of our streams have cobbles in the bottom versus sandy, silty sediments um, because most of that sediment 
is transported from our watershed to our lake. And in that sediment is our number one threat in terms of conservation for Newfound Lake. Um, so stormwater pollution uh, far and away is our largest threat. Um, that sediment or the, the stormwater that's generated out in the watershed from developed areas and changing land uses brings with it um, nutrients, um, household chemicals, fertilizers. This time of year, we're really concerned about salt in our water. Um, and so the buildup of these things in a lake system does a couple of things. Um, it advances eutrophication. Um, so we'll talk about what I mean by that in a couple of slides. Um, but when we see higher rates of sedimentation, uh, we also see increased uh, chances of cyanobacteria blooms. Um, and of course, there's the erosion uh, component uh, and damage to property and infrastructure. Um, this picture on the screen is from um, Winter Storm Elliot, when we got three inches of rain over um, a very short time scale on a deep snowpack with frozen soils. So in terms of flashy storm events, this is the flashiest, <laughs> right? We What little infiltration we would have normally and uptake by vegetation, uh, we didn't see that during this storm event. And I was out during peak flow looking at culverts and bridges and things were really maxed out. You know, we saw uh, localized flooding around our rivers um, and the amount of sediment and stormwater pollution that these events bring is, is significant. This is a really exciting, uplifting part of the talk, just, just to let you know. We'll end on a high note, I promise. Um, but climate change is on there, so it's gonna get lower before it gets higher. Um, our second uh, threat we're gonna talk about is invasive species. And I'll say this many times throughout tonight's presentation that we are really fortunate in Newfound not to have uh, an invasive species problem. Many other lakes near us do, and so tonight we'll be talking about uh, prevention and detection of invasive species instead of um, words like management and remediation. Um, our work would look completely differently if we had invasive species outbreaks. Um, why this is important for lake systems, um, invasive species outcompete their native counterparts quickly, um, taking up limited resources. Um, they alter drastically, uh, aquatic ecosystems, they impact recreation. Those of you who boat, you know, you wouldn't wanna boat through that. Uh, they block sunlight, change fish um, communities and, uh, and decrease property values as well around the lake. Um, far and away, the, the biggest way that invasive species migrate from lake to lake is through recreational boaters. Um, we call these transient boaters, which I think has a kind of a strange connotation to it. Um, but boaters that go from a lake that's currently has an infestation of invasive aquatic plants and bringing them to lakes that don't. Um, at Newfound, uh, through our lake host program, we're finding that around 10% of boaters coming to our public launches are coming from lakes with active infestations. Um, our lake hosts collect a lot of data, which I can talk about later. Um, but we're also finding that most people understand the risks. They're taking preventative measure, measures of cleaning and draining and drying their boat um, before they put it in the water. Um, notable nearby water bodies that are, have invasive um, aquatic plants in them, um, Winnipesaukee, Squam, both Squam Lakes, uh, Squam River, um, Pemi River, so these are, these are places where we could expect people in the area to go and fish and then come back to Newfound Lake. So um, while this is a big threat for us, it's also something we can manage fairly effectively so long as we raise the level of awareness in the community. Um, cyanobacteria, have you heard? <laughs> so um, this is gaining recognition um, throughout the state. It's not that necessarily the, the incidence of cyanobacteria blooms is increasing, but our level of awareness and reporting of those blooms um, is certainly gaining ground. Um, so cyanobacteria are naturally occurring in most 
uh, freshwater bodies, including Newfound Lake. Um, it's really only they only really become a problem when we have elevated nutrients in the lake and they have these bloom events. So they go from having a relatively low concentration um, to overnight or in, in the course of a couple hours having these scale bloom events. Um, they form these blue green scums or films or globules on the lake. Um, and the real environmental impact here is that they take up um, a lot of nutrients when they do this, when they die after the blooms um, die, they go to the bottom of the lake, decompose and consume a lot of oxygen, which is bad for, for fish species and lake chemistry. Um, they also, certain cyanobacteria can contain cyanotoxins, which have been linked to human health um, problems, liver disease, kidney disease, ecological disorders. So the important thing to take away from this slide is if you see anything like this, don't go swimming. Um, take a photo, report it to us. We'll pass it on to DES in short order. Um, and DES is really quick at, at responding and testing for cyanobacteria. Um, statewide last year, I want to say that there was something like 46 blooms. And on average, they lasted uh, about 25 days. Um, so you can imagine, you know, not being able to swim in a lake for 25 days certainly impacts recreation opportunities, local economies. Um, the longest that we saw last year was 100 days. So that's that's an entire season gone. Um, so definitely something to be keeping an eye on. Um, you know, Newfound is fortunate that we are a big, deep and relatively uh, nutrient low lake. Um, so I wouldn't expect to see a lake wide cyanobacteria bloom. Um, but we should definitely be looking at cyanobacteria in some of our shallower basins for sure. All right, now the fun one. Uh, <laughs> so climate change, right? This is certainly the elephant in the room. Um, and it is in the room. Climate change is already impacting our, our local environments, um, certainly impacting our lake. And it, it doesn't necessarily constitute its own um, threat, but it exacerbates existing issues, and it's setting a stage for um, unknowns, right? We, we don't know how our systems will respond to a change in climate to the degree of detail that we know how they're responding to our current climate. Um, the impact kind of manifests in three ways for lakes, increased precipitation and storm intensity, so more stormwater runoff from our, our stream systems, increased temperature, and decreased ice coverage, right? This year we've had a, a pretty um, unique ice season. It happened all in the span of about a week. We went from having no ice to ice on the entire lake um, to some sort of interim state where we're currently at. And what this does is this essentially lengthens the growing time for aquatic plants and algae and um, plankton. Um, and so, Again, it speeds that rate of eutrophication. So everyone feeling good about the future and mm -hmm. the health of Newfound Lake? <laughs> um, it's it's going to be fine. We actually have a pretty spectacular lake in terms of water quality, and I'll go into those numbers here in a second. But the thing to take away is that, um, you know, we do see changes happening in our lake. We are seeing changes happen in the watershed and the health of the lake is really tied to the health of the watershed. So, um, you know, we can do a lot of stuff in the lake in terms of invasive species, but in order to, to, to protect the lake into the future, we need to be thinking beyond the shoreline. Um, so before I dig into our numbers a little bit, I just want to provide a, a little bit of context around lake aging. So I've mentioned eutrophication a couple of times, and our default is to think eutrophication is automatically a bad thing. It's actually describes a natural process of lakes filling in over time, right? So given their kind of placement in the terrain and the sedimentation that, that we get, they do fill in over time. Um, oligotrophic lakes like Newfound have low productivity. So think of productivity, plant growth, al algal growth, um, fish to a certain extent, um, but they have clear water, low nutrients, um, 
And over time, they fill in, uh, they start to fill in, transition to mesotrophic lakes, which just means middle trophic. Um, so you'll get more plants around the exterior of the lake. You might see a reduction in water clarity. Mesotrophic lakes tend to be browner versus blue water. Um, and over time, all lakes will move to a eutrophied state. So this is when you have less dissolved oxygen in the water column, less light available, and, a, and a, just a different system overall. Um, time is important here. So this process can play out over naturally over hundreds or thousands of years. Newfound Lake is about 14,000 years old. Um, and we are very much a oligotrophic lake. So we've got some time. Um, cultural eutrophication is why this word gets its bad rap. And this is when humans get involved. So in more developed watersheds, um, this process can go from lasting thousands of years to decades. Um, and there's been some documented cases of large lakes like Newfound where this process happens relatively fast. Um, Globally, eutrophic, cultural eutrophication is the leading cause of lake degradation. Um, and regionally, there's been some recent studies that have come out saying that in the northern New York, Adirondacks, Finger Lakes to New England, we're seeing about a 40% decrease in oligotrophic lakes within from 2007 to the 2020 or 2020. Um, so the fact that we have a pretty strong oligotrophic system um, is unique and becoming uniquer. That's not a real word, I realize. Um, okay, so how do we actually measure this? Um, some of our water quality volunteers are in the room, so I'm gonna hand it off to, to Barry. <laughs> um, so we have NLRA monitors seven long-term sites throughout the watershed. Um, these were established starting in 1986. Um, they've been monitored on at least a monthly basis. Uh, we've stepped up our monitoring in recent decades um, to more of a weekly basis during the summer. Uh, we get a lot of help from the UNH Lakes Lay Monitoring Program. Um, we really can't collect the data we have without help from volunteers uh, and uh, professionals at UNH. And at each site, when we go out, um, we monitor a whole suite of different parameters. Um, I'm only going to talk about the three that are in this box, because those are the three that most relate to lake trophic status or eutrophication. So water clarity, right? That, that kind of makes sense, how clear that water is, how far we can see into the lake. And that's a good measure of kind of the total amount of suspended sediments in the lake as well as um, algae and other light absorbing part particles. Um, total phosphorus is the limiting nutrient in most aquatic systems. We're gonna get into what that sentence means. We're gonna unpack that. Rebecca's actually gonna jump in and talk about that. Um, and then, <laughs> surprise, and then chlorophyll. So chlorophyll is a plant-based pigment. It's really important for photosynthesis. So measuring the chlorophyll content um, really is more of a direct measurement of, of productivity. So we've got these seven sites. Tonight, we're only going to talk about one. Um, so that's our deep site. Um, this is located centrally in the lake between Whittemore Shores and the ledges. And we look at the deep site for long-term trends for a couple of reasons. Um, the most important is that it's less impacted by seasonal fluctuations or single storm events. So if we're seeing trends at the deep site, um, we can rest assured that we're seeing um, trends kind of lake wide. So we've got a couple graphs coming up just to, to warn you. I'll, I'll walk you through the graphs, but I wanted to put this quick snapshot of how 2022 rates against historic averages. So on this figure, we've got our three parameters. We've got the total number of observations. Um, so this is the size of our, our data set. Um, and then we've got the amount of data that we collected last year. 
The oligotrophic range is kind of the cutoff between oligotrophic lakes and mesotrophic lakes. Uh, and then the averages kind of are self-explanatory. The takeaway here is that 2022 was actually a good year across the board lake-wide for water quality. And uh, why, you might ask? <laughs> um, I've learned that it's really hard to actually answer those questions when it comes to aquatic systems with a, a, a specific cause and effect relationship, but it's safe to say that the last couple of years have been dry in the summer, so we're receiving less input, um, which means we have less um, productivity happening in our lake surface and, and suspended sediments. Um, we also don't have any aquatic invasive plants. We're very fortunate for that. Um, and we had no algal blooms or cyanobacteria blooms last year. So this is a quick snapshot. So I like to think of this as like, should you go swimming in Newfound Lake or not? Yes, go swimming in Newfound Lake. It is a very clean and clear lake. Um, and we, we did really well last year. Um, but a quick comparison of averages doesn't really tell us a lot about how things change. So the next three slides, we're going to talk about lake health over time. So what we see here, this is a graph of water clarity, um, Secchi disk transparency, um, water clarity <laughs> uh, on the, the Y axis and time on the X. Um, the blue dots are individual observations. So we didn't take any averages. These observations are for the summer time period only. Um, the black line represents a statistically fitted trend line. We're not going to get into that. Don't worry. Um, and then the shaded area on either side of that black line represents our confidence in the placement of that line. Um, all you need to know about that is when we have more data, this area shrinks, and when we have less, it grows. But we're still very confident that the line falls somewhere in that gray area. Took some time because the next three are very similar to this. Um, in terms of trends, right, I think I can let your eyes see some pretty significant things happening in this figure. Um, the first thing to know is that in 1986, our data record starts at a period of elevated development in the watershed. Those of you guys who have been around longer than I have will remember the condominium associations going in. There's a bit of a boom during this time period. And then we see a pretty um, significant decline in clarity into the late 90s and then a rebound through the, the 2000s. Right. Again, that question of why, what's driving this? Um, certainly, the development has a role to play, but we also saw through the 90s a, a series of large storm events. Um, there were a couple of hurricanes that came through. There was a major ice storm, which damages how the, the watershed um, ecosystems function. But we do see this rebound, which is, which is great to see. Um, 2011. Hurricane Irene, pretty significant impact lake-wide. Um, I was not in the watershed when this happened, but you can see that we went from seeing about 30 feet, 28, 30 feet, um, to seeing about six feet lake-wide. Um, so pretty drastic. And then 2019, this was a big storm um, that came through and dropped five inches of rain in Groton over a pretty concentrated time period. Um, so seeing a bunch of trends over time, we're seeing the lake absorb those trends. Um, we don't see, if we look at the data record overall, we don't see an increase or a decrease. But when by looking at these long time scales, we're missing some of the story, right? We're missing these individual storm events. So moving on to phosphorus. Um, phosphorus is the limiting nutrient in lake systems, and this picture on the left, right, on your right, uh, is from a pretty famous study that Rebecca's going to talk about. 
I think this is a pretty wild example of a whole in, or, you know, entire ecosystem experiment. This was done in 77, 78 in a lake in Canada that had, that's just a narrow section that connected two sections of the lake. On the sort of the top side, they put um, nitrogen, I'm gonna remember, forget one of the other nutrients in there, um, but not phosphorus. On the bottom side that turned green had those same nutrients in it, the nitrogen, I wanna say it was calcium. Do you remember, Rick? Yeah, it's calcium. Okay, thank you. Um, and then they added phosphorus as well. The And there is an impermeable barrier in between those two sections. Um, so this was how they confirmed that phosphorus is the limiting nutrient in, in temperate lake ecosystems, such as this one, such as, um, such as, um, as uh, Newfound as well. And uh, do you want me to give an example of how, why that's significant? You want me sure. to? Okay. Yeah has to do with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Um, this is a pr pretty simplified version of you know what um, how to think about a limiting nutrient. So if you're making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, you have all the peanut butter in the world and all the jelly in the world, but you have four slices of bread, how many sandwiches can you make? Two, or you know maybe four half sandwiches or eight open face sandwiches, but you're limited by what? The bread. So in this case, um, you know, of course, very simplified phosphorus is, is like the bread in this, that you're not gonna see as much productivity in the lake if you don't have that phosphorus um, addition. And that's different in, uh, in other types of lake ecosystems and definitely different in marine systems as well, so. Cool. I know we were gonna talk about food, but <laughs> it is past dinner time, so. Um, so yeah, so phosphorus is the limiting nutrient. Um, it is the bread to our peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Um, and what we see is kind of the inverse trend of clarity, which makes sense, right? So if clarity is kind of the bulk measurement of sediment and things in the water, those sediments bring with it nutrients, bring with it, with it phosphorus. So during that same period where we're seeing the decline from the mid to late 80s through the 90s, we're seeing an increase in phosphorus. And the interesting thing to pay attention to here is, right, this oligotrophic threshold is at 80. So we got pretty close to that threshold during that time period. Um, things cooled off in the lake. I'm not sure exactly what was going on in the 2000s, uh, but you can see that the lake eventually gradually de decreased in phosphorus concentration. Um, and now we're averaging around um, 4.1 4 um, moving forward. Um, it would be really interesting to know what was happening before 19. 86, um, and there are some ways that we can approximate that. Um, but what's, you know, just by looking at the three data points we have, so that's the serious limitation, right? If this curve was to bottom out somewhere down here, we'd be very low phosphorus, and then suddenly we're somewhere more elevated moving forward. That would be something to, to definitely pay attention to. Um, but we're speculating here. So phosphorus is limiting. What does it limit? It limits productivity. It limits um, plant growth, algal growth, and plankton growth. Um, so what we see is similar to phosphorus. We see this um, increase of chlorophyll in our lake as well. Um, what's interesting, this does, doesn't always happen, but it happens in this case. So uh, our phosphorus peaks around 1999 our chlorophyll peaks around 2002. So there's a, a time delay in this. Um, and again, things kind of cool off, come back down, and you can still see the impact of Hurricane Irene in 2011, and then some of the larger storms, um, that 2019 storm, uh, we see maybe just a little bit of uptick to come in the future uh, from the inputs we received in 2019, uh, but time will tell. So that was a lot of graphs. <laughs> if there's one thing I want you to take away is that Newfound is still in good shape. Go swimming, go fishing, enjoy it. Um, but we are have seen some pretty significant changes to our lake in recent memory. And given the fact that the climate is changing, we're seeing increased development, we really need to be focused on building resilience in our system um, here and now. And so the next and final part of tonight's presentation talks about how we're doing that. Rebecca is going to provide an overview 
of how we engage towns, um, water, other partner organizations, and large landowners in doing that work. And then I'll close by talking about some of our programs that engage community members, volunteers, and kind of how all of us can do our part. Um, so with that. All right, so Paul mentioned earlier that we've got a lot of really steep slopes in our watershed. Um, fortunately, most of those steep slopes are covered in forest, and the best way to protect our water quality is to make sure we keep our forests, especially our forests on the steep slope, intact. So land conservation is, is the way we do that, and um, over 24% of the watershed is in protection right now um, through some form or the other. Um, but the our forested slopes encourage water to infiltrate into the ground instead of running off um, unlike uh, you know roofs and driveways whether they're gravel or concrete or pavement um, our roads um, all those hardened surfaces get uh, water to concentrate and run off picking up pollutants bringing them into streams ponds and ultimately the lake as well so making sure we protect the the land is how we can protect our water it's the best way if we, as we see these climate change conditions increase with increased storms, in, um, intense storms, to make sure that we're encouraging the water to infiltrate. Um, you know, if a for nicely forested hill slope is maybe not going to be resilient against a seven inch storm like we saw in July of 2019, but it'll certainly help in those multi inch storms that we're seeing more frequently. Um, the seven inch storms hopefully will be rare. Um, Land conservation doesn't just protect water quality. Uh, the Trust for Public Land in 2011 came out with a study that said for every dollar that's invested in land conservation, there's a, an $11 return on investment. A lot of those things are kind of those intangible ecosystem services, but some of them include, uh, you know, which includes wildlife protection, um, forestry and agriculture, viewshed protection, wildlife habitat, things like that. Um, there's different ways to protect land, um, land that still allows forestry often has a forest management pr um, plan in place as well. So you have forest pract forestry practices, but you also have good forestry practices that help maintain a healthy, healthy working forest. Um, the way we do land conservation in the Newfound Watershed is through a collaborative partnership called the Newfound Land Conservation Partnership that involves key community members from across the watershed, and then some major players in land conservation throughout the state, including the Society for the Protection of New Hampshire Forests. Also, you might hear them called SPINIF or the Forest Society, um, the Lakes Region Conservation Trust, and the Nature Conservancy. So these entities and individuals work together to make sure that land is protected. We're connecting with community members, with large parcel landowners. Um, it's really a grassroots effort that has been incredibly successful. Um, so of the 14,891 acres that are now protected, 24% of the watershed, more than half of that was protected under the guidance of the, the Land Conservation Partnership in the past 13 or 14 years. Um, we had a just under 200 acres conserved in 2022. A lot of land conservation happens right at the end of the the year, so um, I might have the something might have come in at 2023. But we've got um, a significant parcel up on Bear Mountain that we really had a grassroots effort to work to protect. That um, piece of parcel is you can see it up there. It's um, number 26 um, on the on the map. Um, and then we have our first parcel of land conservation in the watershed within the town of Bridgewater that happened as well. Um, ways you can get involved in land conservation, join us for hikes. We'll be offering monthly hikes coming up starting either next month or month after to check out different land uh, ways that land are conserved. Um, and if you have family lands that you'd like to see protected into the future, we can certainly help facilitate that and get you in touch um, with the right land trust and the right the right people to make that happen. So I mentioned earlier, we could probably do four presentations based on what we're presenting today. I did an entire master's thesis on watershed planning, so I'll try and keep this simple, but um, watershed planning is a big part of what drives our action-oriented water quality protecting efforts. Um, I think watershed planning, some might find it 
a little dry and boring. I think it's kind of this magical place where science meets government meets social practices. Um, it's kind of this this the space where where all these things come together, where we're looking at what are our current water quality conditions? What are our current development conditions? What are our local regulations? And kind of putting those together and making some recommendations to help us make sure that water quality either stays as it is or gets better using some um, what we would call structural solutions. So those are going to be big and small scale projects. Um, maybe some some non-structural solutions. So those might be some town regulations um, and then some education efforts as well. And I'll give a couple examples of some successful town regulations that we've we've seen. Um, we've uh, Hebron has adopted the watershed plan. Every acre counts. Um, and has also we've had some lake friendly ordinances that have been adopted as well. Um, Hebron actually has a water quality ordinance. Um, we've helped Bristol and Hebron come up with some compliance checklists and um, and we've also helped some master planning services and some other watershed towns as well. For structural projects, um, we've done these both on the small scale and the large scale. The small scale, some of you might be familiar with what we were used to call our youth conservation core, where we're working with private property owners, um, private homeowners to improve the, or stop water from running off their property into the lake and encourage it to infiltrate. Um, now the numbers on that project are, kind of tiny compared to some of the bigger projects that we've already implemented. Um, the, a Berea Road uh, culvert in Hebron, Shem Valley Road in Alexandria, and then some um, after the 2019 storm, we helped uh, the town of Groton with some, um, some projects on Sculpture Rock Road and Province Lake Road. Um, the homeowner project, I put up there and I put them first because I think that's a I think it's pretty empowering for private homeowners to not just look at big projects. What's the state doing? What's the town doing? But instead looking internally and seeing what can I do to protect water quality on my property. It, to me, in, in a lot of ways, it's a first step to making really meaningful change throughout the watershed. And I know we have at least a, hand, a few people who've implemented some small scale projects on their own property. Um, speaking of, you know, and I don't want to call them a drop in the bucket because they are very important. But if you look at some upcoming projects that we have in the amount of sediment and phosphorus that will be removed from these projects, um, until 2019, Rankin Road in Bridgewater was the number one polluting site in the around the lake. Now that is a Class Six road in Hebron, or sorry, in Bridgewater. Um, the we should take a look at it. Here it is. Um, it is a obviously a dirt road with a, a stream running to the side of it. The solution is actually fairly simple. We did some engineering plans a couple of years ago, and we'll implement these ideally this summer. And those will just encourage water to, there'll be some ditch turnouts that'll get that stream to run into the forest where it can infiltrate into the ground instead of running down the side of the, the road, jumping into the road and catching more of that road sediment and bringing it to the lake. Um, as I said, that'll hopefully be adjust or fixed by the end of 2023. But going back to this slide, that was 179 pounds of phosphorus and 360,000 pounds of sediment um, removed per year on these sites by fixing them. Atwell Brook, which is the site, many of you remember that July 2019 storm that turned the lake brown for a short amount of time. It was seven inches of rain in Groton, kind of just absurd amount of rainfall. Um, that really kind of makes Rankin Road look kind of small. Um, and we actually we currently have engineering plans to remedy that site. And we're looking for funding. Fish and Game has just um, committed $50,000 to which we'll be able to leverage as match for some federal funding. So um, that is a slow moving process, but it is we are moving towards making sure that that site uh, we should take a look at that one too. Here's Atwell Brook. You can see the eroded stream bank up on the side. The stream is supposed to be in the channel that's closer to the, the front of the screen there. And um, our plan, which could involve helicopters with volunteers from the, the National Guard to help us move some trees in there. They, they do some training programs that, get, that help projects such as these, um, but it'll be a natural naturalized stream bank to try and encourage water to go in a place where it's not constantly um, um, eroding that bank. So I'll turn it back to Paul with some more small scale stormwater. So I'm going to say that small scale stormwater projects, because they fall on my desk, are more than just a drop in the bucket. <laughs> uh, certainly on an individual scale, um, you know, 
these projects are kind of in a much smaller league. But when we add the cumulative effects of residential stormwater pollution together, it's, it's actually a pretty significant source of, of pollution to the lake. Um, the way we live, our homes, our driveways, our lawns, our landscaping, um, all generate and concentrate stormwater. Um, it's a misconception that, that lawns actually infiltrate stormwater. Um, they do to a certain extent, but a well-maintained lawn only infiltrates about 17% of the water that falls on it. The rest is moving overland in sheet flow. Um, and certainly our roofs and our driveways uh, are impervious. This is also something that we can address pretty easily, right? A lot of the residential um, stormwater management practices are easy to implement, relatively affordable. Um, a lot of residential stormwater management revolves around um, slowing water down, allowing it to infiltrate, um, allowing it to be absorbed by, by plants and gardens. So they actually beautify our outdoor spaces. Um, and of course they protect property value, right? It's one thing when a town road washes out and the town has to take care of it. It's another thing when your driveway or your lawn washes out. Um, so controlling stormwater at the source and our residences are all source is far and away the best way to prevent stormwater pollution. And in a lake community, um, you know, shorefront property owners, there's just not a large uh, amount of land available to steer water into to allow it to infiltrate. So we have to take care of it um, at home. The thing I want you to know is that NLRA uh, should be your go-to resource in, for stormwater management. Uh, Rebecca mentioned we used to run a program, the Youth Conservation Corps. Um, we're bringing that back in some ways as the small scale stormwater program. Uh, but we can help with assessing stormwater on your property. We can help with designing management practices. And um, through our AmeriCorps Watershed Steward Program, we can also help with installations for um, you know, impactful projects. We also have a slew of DIY resources that will be on our website before the end of winter, <laughs> before things really start to melt and flow. Um, so if you're at all interested, in um, working on stormwater at home, give us a call, uh, stop by the office. Our next program, um, our invasive species um, prevention program. Um, this one's really cool. Like I said, we don't have an active infestation of invasive aquatic plants um, and we need to keep it that way. Uh, far and away, it's, it's way more cost effective um, to prevent uh, invasive species and it is trying to manage them when they get here. Um, we do this in two ways. Our lake host program, no doubt if you've been to one of Newfound's public launches, you've probably come across the lake host. Um, they are really important in terms of educating the boating public. Uh, they perform courtesy boat inspections. Last year, this number astounded me. I had no idea we had this many people coming and visiting Newfound Lake. At Wellington and Gray Rocks, we conducted 4,155 um, boat inspections. So just a ton of people coming to Newfound Lake. Um, lake hosts are also an important mouthpiece for the Newfound Lake Region Association. Um, they connect our mission to people that might just be visiting Newfound for a weekend, uh, for the afternoon, um, and, and definitely grow our membership base that way. Um, they also collect a ton of data. So um, not only are they out there looking for hitchhiking plants on trailers and boats, uh, but they're getting um, data on where people are coming from, where they're heading to next, if their boat's clean, drained, and dried. Um, and they're instrumental in terms of rolling out some other programs like our lead-free tackle exchange program. So that's the, the prevention side. Um, of things, our early detection side, our weed watcher program. This was one that, like Rebecca said, we focused quite a bit on this past year. Um, weed watchers are trained volunteers. Um, they attend one of our trainings um, and get trained up in aquatic plant identification. So weed watchers know what native plants look like in Newfound Lake. They also know what to look for in terms of invasive species. Um, 
And they are committed to going out once a month to do a more detailed survey of an area of the lake of their choosing. So usually for a shorefront property owner, um, this is an area around their, their shore, quarter mile either side. Um, they do a little bit more detailed survey and report their findings back. Um, the, we also ran, a, for the first time, a lake-wide weed watching event. This was the Weed Stampede, um, aptly named. Um, we had over 20 volunteers take part in this two-day event where we tried to do the entire lake in two days. Um, we didn't get the entire lake, but we did, I want to say it was over 68%, something like that. Um, we had these folks paddled a, a total of 80 miles um, over those two days. Um, and the combined efforts of our weed watchers and the weed stampede, we've surveyed 94% of Newfound's near short area, which is pretty staggering. So when we say we don't have invasive species in Newfound, we can say that with a degree of certainty for the first time in a while. Um, and again, the best way to prevent um, the introduction of invasives is to make sure that you're cleaning and draining and drying your boat after each use, uh, even if it's just coming to Newfound. Some of the plant material um, seeds of some invasive species can dry and be viable for a number of years afterwards. So just, just clean boats a good boat. <laughs> I think most boaters would agree. Uh, and of course, tonight's presentation would look very different if it wasn't for the efforts of our water quality monitors. Um, you know, in addition to our seven lake sites, which have a weekly collection, uh, we maintain uh, a number of sites out in the watershed to understand kind of the input side of um, the, the equation. So lake monitoring is really about the effects of uh, what's coming into the lake. Tributary monitoring is trying to understand um, the causes. And of course, water quality monitoring really allows us to look at trends over time, which is why I was excited about tonight, and respond to those trends in a much more timely fashion in, in lieu of waiting for an algal bloom and asking what happened. Um, so building watershed resilience is a community effort. We cannot do the work we do without the support of our community, without the engagement of our volunteers, um, there are so many ways to get involved, whether that's, you know, working on stormwater at home, learning about the aquatic biota of Newfound Lake, uh, protecting it against invasives. Um, you know, I recognize a lot of faces in this room. I know this is preaching to the choir, um, but if you or someone you know wants to get involved, wants to get involved in a different way, has questions about Newfound Lake, um, our office is always open. Drop us a line. Um, or an email, give us a call. We're, we're here for you. And really thank you to all of you guys who make our work that much more impactful. So that's what I got. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Parker's got a question. That's why he's here. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> What's your data? I take it. Yep. I can say. Do you see any correlation, any changes in the temperatures, or any impact on the climate change? Mm -hmm. So, are we seeing anything that would suggest some correlation here? So regionally, so I first year here, we're really focused on digging into these data at this level. Um, definitely will be looking at temperature in more detail in the coming year. Uh, but I can say regionally, we are seeing lakes in New England warm as a response to climate change. Um, that's out there in the peer reviewed literature. Um, I can't give you a concrete answer on Newfound. Um, but I would expect that we we are seeing those changes. Hmm. Bill? Well, do you have um, do you have the records of the best and the worst of the measurement areas of the seven measurement areas in the lake? 
Yes. I mean, so, right, comparing this on like a, a best versus worst is hard to do. Each basin, each site is its own kind of system. Mm -hmm. um, we have the same amount, we've, we've done the same analysis at each of those seven sites. Right. Um, generally, they follow the same trend. They tend to be a little bit more responsive since they're closer to shore. So that trend through the 90s is a little bit deeper um, at, say, Pasquani or Loon Island. Um, but they all kind of follow a general trend in the same pattern. In terms of, you know, apples to apples comparisons, I mean, yeah, it's 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 hard to tell, Bill. I mean, we can come and you know we can talk about each site specifically. Uh, if you've got one in mind, I'm happy to to look at those. Well, the question is why I'm asking is the worst is not really bad. Is what I think is what you're telling. Correct. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, you know our highest. Well, our highest um, total phosphorus reading, for instance, was a peak of 14 parts per billion, which is pretty bad for an oligotrophic lake. It puts us over that threshold, but it was kind of an instantaneous reading and it came back down. Um, and it's 14 parts per billion is squarely in the mesotrophic range. So it's it's still not bad, but our lake was able to recover from that. So, so yeah, even on a bad day, Newfound is good. And I think also it just shows that looking at one snapshot means we caught that one data point at 14 point something parts per billion. Um, we might not be catching others. We might be missing other really good water quality. We're not taking continuous data. So we're really catching snapshots every time we go out there. So we have to infer the best we can and doing some statistical analysis, looking at averages is gonna be a little bit more inform informative than trying to capture just me, uh, min and max for, for each site. Yeah. So we don't have current use. Um, so the we've done some some conservation. This is going to be a roundabout answer, so just bear with me. Uh, yes. So um, you were asking if the the question was, and if I got this wrong, please. <laughs> I wasn't answering. I wasn't thinking in order to repeat it. But the um, the question was that um, what do, when we're looking at conservation priorities, what's considered conservation land and what's not considered conservation land? Did I? Yeah. Yeah. Maps of other areas that are not technically conservation areas. Yeah. So the land that's on there is, uh, that we have on those maps is um, state owned land that's protected, um, local conservation land, um, locally owned, so municipality owned, so um, a forest. Um, a town forest would be if it's an official town forest that has been officially conserved as a town forest, um, any land that's been permanently protected. Um, so the challenge with current use and land that seems like it's not going to go anywhere, it's not a permanent protection. It, it could go somewhere. It might very likely might not for a while, but the whole purpose of land conservation is to make sure that it gets put in permanent protection. Um, yeah. We can certainly look at like percent forest cover, um, but but not but not considering the land that's you know if you're talking like the summer camps, Pasquani has actually put a lot of land into conservation. I think some of the other camps have as well. Likely they're not going anywhere, but they could. So that's not considered permanently conserved. So you said that phosphorus is a the thing to keep out of the lake? Where's that coming from primarily? So I'm going to answer maybe yeah. the, the first part of this and then Rebecca can tag on. So phosphorus is naturally occurring in soils. Um, so that's why we're worried about like stream bank erosion happening. Um, we also find it in fertilizers, although in our area, our soils don't tend to be limited by phosphorus in the same way our water is. Um, so our fertilizers um, don't have a ton of phosphorus in them. Um, and where else is phosphorus from? <laughs> in, um, human waste, pet waste. Yeah. Um, so septic system, faulty septic systems can be an issue. There is a certain amount of atmospheric deposition that happens as well. Um, another thing that happens, you found a deep lake. We have 
um, a lot of sediment that's run off. Phosphorus is sticky. It tends to be stick to sediment. So that's why it, we are really concerned about erosion, as Paul said. Um, a lot of that will filter and settle down in the lake. When we get um, later summer in some of the deep zones, you'll see some um, oxygen. Um, the oxygen will disappear from the lake and then you'll get actually a resuspension of phosphorus as well when you get ano anoxic conditions in the bottom of the lake. It's something we have a pretty deep lake and it's hard to get a board that's long enough to be able to measure the oxygen down at the bottom. Um, but um, but we will we will see some of that resuspension of, of phosphorus. So. Very good. I'd like to know the septic system that was talked about 10 years ago in Bristol. Is that a sewer. Dead project? The or? sewer project. Um, so so the, the question, yeah. Yes, yeah. thank you. <laughs> the question was about the sewer system in Bristol um, that was actually reproposed and is currently not an active project um, as far as I know. and. NLRA did take a position on that project and we were in support of it, provided that Bristol didn't change any of the um, any of their zoning regulations to allow for greater density of development. Um, it's hard to enumerate exactly how much nutrient influence we're getting from septic. Um, even the scientific um, research, it, it generally says, yes, it's impactful, but it's hard to get that number. Um, so would a sewer system, a sewer, have, you know, it, it extended sewer was a recommendation of our original watershed plan, certainly will impact water quality. It's hard to say how much, though. So. So. No word, there's a great cesspool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not at your and house, though, right? It's about 20 feet from the lane. Yeah. So other things you can do to protect water quality, your septic system should be pumped every three to five years. That's much more frequent than your average homeowner is going gonna, is gonna to be doing. Yeah. Southern, southern end of the lake, around the area of Avery Crouch Beach, every um, or in late winter or early spring, there's like a river or something that cuts through the beach. And I mentioned it to people, and they just want to be on town, and they're like, oh, yeah, that happens every year. But then somebody fixes it, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, what is that? Is it good that that happens, or is that being a problem? I don't understand about that. Yeah, I'm just going to repeat it for the okay. folks at home. This was a question about a, a spring water that flows across Avercrest Beach and what that might mean for the lake. Um, so I'm not sure of this particular instance of where it's coming from, right? But I mean, we do see elevated groundwater in the spring. So it makes sense that we might see seasonal streams happen. Um, the fact that it's happening at Avery Krause, which is draining directly or, or there's a lot of development right around that area is definitely a concern for, for water quality. Um, you know, water that drains from a developed area like um, across the road from A.V. Kraus um, definitely has higher loading of potential pollutants in it. It's coming through a pipe. Oh, it's, okay. okay. <laughs> um, okay. I'm not familiar with that particular Yeah. Well, I will put it on my list of things to go check out this spring. Um, and uh, and yeah, become a little bit more acquainted with it. I'm going to chalk this one up to this time last year. I was coming up to <laughs> all things newfound. Um, so I haven't been out to that particular spot yet. Dam system was controlling the level of the lake. Um, have you seen any changes since they've kind of gone into this new pattern of when they, you know, raise the lake and lower the lake? So I'm going to repeat this question and then Rebecca is going to answer this one. So this question was about lake levels. Uh, we had a push recently to change how the dam manages lake levels. And the question was, have we seen any impact from that? So the the way it is currently, so it was 2019, the state started managing the lake at a modified interim management curve. And it's my understanding that sometime in the middle of 2022, so this past summer, they started managing it back at the previous management curve. So um, so they've, I don't believe they've issued a um, 
a final decision. And if somebody else knows, um, please let me know. But I don't believe that they've actually, they haven't issued a, a decision saying they're going to do that, but they stopped managing it under the new, um, the new management curve. So with a, um, so our record, so our data goes through 2022. Um, it's hard to say the way we're collecting the data if we catch something specific like that. But I do see that Rick has his hand up over here. <laughs> and with one small piece of that, um, we monitor the profile of the Cockermouth River and the Delta to see how much the Cockermouth has actually moved sediment through the channel into the lake. And for the two years under the modified operating curve, it was deepening the channel every year. And then this September, when we measured it after they went back to the old, uh, it actually showed a significant decrease in the square foot cross-sectional area of the river at the mouth. So that was, it seemed to indicate a consistent trend where a lower lake level by that six inch differential meant that more water was moving through the channel in the parking lot, even though it's counterintuitive to think of less water. So I'm just going to summarize really quickly. Um, Rick Vanderpool just said that there we could see some difference in how the um the channel mapped in the the cocker mouth um under the interim curve and it seemed like it was going back um when they stopped managing it under the interim curve that was a very not very well worded version of what rick said but there it is on the record yeah here several times and they've had several sessions in bridgewater as a matter of fact and they've explained it all and they were they were experimenting and and are we involved at all in following what they're doing and what they're going to do and keeping that contact as best as we can we're trying to keep in touch and, and yeah you know need to come at least every two years and explain it to everybody but i know around the lake there's a lot of controversy <laughs> about the, the levels and what people yep. need to do and what's you know fishing game the whole gamut of people and I think it's a it's an important subject that that the area needs to keep up with. So this was more of a comment that perhaps it would be better if we this is for the record, everyone, to uh to just try and bring a dialogue back every couple of years so people can can understand what how lake levels are managed and um, the different stakeholders that are involved. So and the DES or it's the DES Dam Bureau that manages it. They, they're not <laughs> acknowledging what the reality is. Right. Yeah, I, I, I haven't heard that they've gone back. I thought yeah. they were still testing the, the lower levels. By All right, I'll send them an email tomorrow <laughs> asking them if they made a decision again. Yeah. <laughs> we did send them a letter just reiterating our original position that incur encouraging them very nicely to to keep the interim modified, modified interim, however. Um, as the as the final for their final decision. So can I change the subject? <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> um, so there's all the stuff you talked about sediment coming into the lake. And you have 37 tributary monitoring sites. Um, I'm just curious how have you had some success in coordinating with the towns around Newfound in A identifying where the problem crossings are, road crossings and culverts and bridges, and what actions the towns are taking to improve those problems so we can drop that sediment out or it gets to the lake. Yes, and ongoing. Um, so the question was about working with towns and trying to work, identify priority sites so we can work together to bring the amount of sediment and phosphorus that actually reaches the lake down. Um, so yeah, we we have great relationships with the town. Um, they've been a part of the watershed planning process. Every watershed planning grant iteration we do, and we're in our so one grant one uh, one grant got us the plan, and then the four subsequent um, versions had or were all implementation. Each implementation round, we're bringing an environmental planner to the um, to each of the towns to address to help them 
where they are to be able to address land use regulations. So that's that's one side of things. Land regulations, of course, are at the whim of town meeting and um, and the voters in each town. So those can be challenging. But we also work pretty well with the with the town um, their road agents. And actually, this Atwell Brook was re we've been working really closely with the town of Groton Select Board and trying to get to get, get the site addressed. So they've been with us at every site visit. Um, and pulling in fish and game has made it an even more meaningful partnership. So that's just an example there. Um, you can also look, we've done a full watershed culvert study and you can actually show it to the road agent in Groton and he's like, you missed this one and this one. And, <laughs> and he knows every culvert. And so, I mean, what a resource those road agents are and bringing them on board is, I think one of the more valuable things we can do. So yes, we're doing that. Yes, we could do more. And then this is kind of hot off the presses, different scale again, um, but we're currently working with students from Plymouth State to develop some survey tools for surveying um, developed areas. So mapping individual driveway culverts, looking at hydrologic conductivity um, in residential areas near the lakeshore. And so those tools are kind of coming, they're in the works, and I hope that they are allow us to kind of highlight some, some potential problem areas that we can work on. I think the wrap it up music has just started playing. Um, yeah. <laughs> are there any any questions on from our our online audience that we can answer really quickly? Okay, great. Cool. Um, please reach out to us if you have additional questions. We are a resource to this community, and we'd love to help and get out in the field and check things out too. So yeah, so, yeah thank you all for attending. <laughs>